Okay, great. I guess this is time to start. Uh, well, I guess most of you already met through Hyatt. He is one of our collaborators in the Nordic Nascovitz project. And uh, today he's going to talk about uh, one of the real collaborators which was formed during this Nordic COVID meeting. And uh, at the moment, he is not doing epidemic modeling, some other stuff, which you may tell. But anyway, this was like a very cool talk that uh, he presented in our last meeting in Copenhagen, and I asked him to uh, do it here. But before starting, uh, on Eva, can you hear us in normal? Uh, yeah, more or less. Okay, hello. Okay, and just in case the video that we are, like the camera is there, so. If you want to switch it to your front camera, you can just switch it. Anyway, you can just start now. Yeah, well, I, I can start. Okay, hello everybody. So yes, indeed, uh, my name is Mikhail and I'm now working in the University of Helsinki, but I'm also like associated with Alto and this work was done with Alto. So the title is Influence of cross border Mobility on how COVID spread in particular Nordic country. And how do I switch the slides here? Oh, now it's working. So this is a collaboration with uh, basically 10 different people for, from four Nordic countries. Uh, also three more people are here from Aldo as well. Uh, the idea behind this paper was as following, like we have a meeting between the Nordic modelers and we but, well, let's let's kind of collaborate. Let's do a model of four Nordic countries together, not just uh, every model sits in their own country, country and model its own country. But let's do a collaboration. And what do we gain from doing a combined Nordic model? Well, we can kind of look at the mobility between countries. So we, this is what we did. Um, the conclusion what we got from these papers generally speaking, they're kind of not very surprising, right? They're, they're pretty much uh, mathematical proof of things you already know. So how does uh, the mobility, people moving within countries influence the spread of a disease? Well, there are certain uh, kind of condition when this mobility matters. First, there should be this balance of infection between countries. So one country should have a lot of infection, and another should have very few. And then there should be like people moving between two countries. So if it happens, then um, then infection would travel. Otherwise, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, and um, and then uh, kind of what people do when they travel also matters, not with just whatever we cross the border or not. So um, now when I finished with this uh, conclusion kind of was uh, maybe the most boring part of this paper. So I now let me talk about the interesting part of the paper. But before, let's talk about the, the context, context, just for you to uh, remember. So in our paper, we focused on particular year 2020 from uh, Nordic. We modeled four different Nordic countries. And this is kind of a uh, number of hospitalization uh, from COVID in this particular year. So we have uh, first cases coming uh, in February. 2020, when we kind of have a small outbreak uh, by the mid-April, uh, most of the countries implemented uh, strict measures against uh, restrictive measures. So the infection, it, like the number of hospitalization went down, then we from the middle of March, March actually. So, but when Sweden kind of have their more uh, let's say fair approach, so we have a kind of outbreak which continued much uh, longer. And then at the end of a year, we have a, by the end of a year, we got a second wave of COVID, so numbers 
started to increase in all countries, while well, Denmark in particular here have very large number of cases. This particular year is very nice from a perspective of epidemic modeling. It's very simple to model, whereas like um, no vaccination going on, so no immunity from vaccine, whereas just a single variant of COVID, only wild type. Um, even in Sweden and Denmark, where it is only like up to 20% of people that are infected. So there's no herd immunity. Uh, all the complexity which associated with, with modeling of uh, infection disease are not really here. We can use very, very simple model for this. Now, context in terms of mobility, how many people travel between Nordic countries in this particular uh, year. So um, this was actually quite hard question to ask. It's turned out to, to be that uh, people don't know when we started uh, working on this project. So uh, we have to dig for data or aggregate a lot of data sources to actually estimate the number of crossing borders between countries. And well, I wasn't particularly doing this part of uh, work, but it's pretty now to be pretty substantial and interesting. So this is a conclusion about mobility. And this picture here depicts a number of border crossing during the modeling, modeling period. So during um, uh, COVID uh, between these four Nordic countries and the rest of the world and split into four different um, means of transportation. So you can see, for example, here, Arizona Bridge with a lot of people um, to, um, moving on the railroads. Um, some ferry also important for, uh, for Nordic countries. There's a big road uh, from Denmark to Germany. It's a lot of uh, people traveling where. One thing to notice here is the number of border crossing is quite huge. The amount of people who just traveled through Arizona Bridge during this period, and this is already with restriction, right? Is equal to the population of Denmark. And if you just like combine all these numbers together, where like it's a huge number of people, population of Denmark is like five million, uh, Nor uh, Norway and Finland like about five million, Sweden about ten million. So this number is pretty comparable. There is a lot of travel going on. Now, in this um, study, we kind of realized totally on that just crossing the border is not really enough to model the effect of uh, infection. So we at least split those people into two groups. So we have uh, we have our long duration travels and commuters. And for commuters, we think they um, cross the border and then return back home at the same day. So I spent like half a day at the destination countries. And um, for long generation travelers, for this paper, we just assume they, they leave and they stay, or at least they stay uh, for the rest of it, like they recover in the destination countries and they may come back, but they will count it as another long duration traveler. And with some of medical magic, uh, which also I wasn't involved really in, we can split uh, the number, the travelers we have here into commuters and long duration travelers. So, for example, here's the, a lot of commuters coming from Copenhagen to Malmö through Arizona Bridge, as we find out, but there was some people traveling, for example, to fin from Finland to Sweden in Torni, which is like a city up here. Of course, there's a lot of commuters. But otherwise, uh, most of the travelers were counted as long duration. And uh, like, yeah, this is this is a number uh, showing you up for ready for uh, COVID period. So this is already with restrictions. Before restrictions, the numbers were like um, maybe three times bigger and Norway, and, like Sweden and Norway have a train between them, but it was closed during COVID. So yeah. This is an example of more data, how it uh, behaves uh, with time. So this is um, 
time interval uh, before restrictions. So there's a lot of travel when there is like, original kind of drop in numbers of travelers when it kind of recovered. Uh, this is Finnish, Swedish border and Finnish Russian border is like dropped and never recovered. Okay, so this is context for um, uh, for vulnerability situation. So how do you then model it? First, we take this uh, model. So this is kind of standard model into in the epidemiology. So kind of say our model people get. Uh, people are susceptible first when they get infected with the recovery. It's a little bit looks complicated, but it's really made up of very simple components. And what is importantly, it's kind of standard in the field. So we have this standard SAR model. You are susceptible when you get infected when you recover, and when we add, add kind of components representing long mobility between countries. So we have like four countries here, and we like travel, and when we put. Uh, fifth countries like our or zero country outside world, and when we kind of add a short term mobility matrix, which somehow uh, influence your transition from susceptibility to infectious state. So, uh, what's important here, we implemented uh, long term mobility, short term mobility in computers in a different mathematical way in this particular model. We have a question here. So this is specific. You work at the level of the entire country. Yes, we, yes, we work at the level of very entire country. So no sub geographical division here, and even no age group. Some like just four countries, meta very just four meta populations. But still, I mean, just thinking if I would have to quickly implement a model that would be just for different regions of Finland, then it would be the same model because it doesn't really. If you have the mobility numbers, it doesn't. You could choose your units as you wish, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like um, nothing really uh, between countries here. Yeah, yeah. But, but within a country, if you just regions are playing the same role as your countries in this model, then it would be roughly it, the same. It would be the same, yeah. right? If we would have some data, we would yeah. Yeah. model it the same way. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of four different populations. There's nothing saying that have like border controls between them or, or anything like this. Uh, and after we build the system, we build this model, we start feeding to a data, we kind of make the data, start feeding them, and then we encounter that kind of unexpected problem. And the problem was how do we even quantify the effect of, not more, I, I, I haven't corrected this, uh, this typo since uh, Copenhagen talk. How do you even quantify the effect of mobility? So, uh, state of art, it's been obviously not the first people who, who do it, but what people usually do is they ask the question um, how mobility or border crossing affect the start of epidemic? So, you start in kind of uh, uh, with a totally naive population, no infection, when you have uh, infection pressures from abroad and you cross the borders, how, how, for how long it would delay the start of a wave. So you, uh, it, it, there's a lot of papers on this uh, subject and uh, the conclusion which people made is unless the, your border closure is absolute and there's no like leakage between them, uh, border controls can only delay the start of a pandemic maybe for weeks or for, usually just for some weeks. So we, uh, naturally people usually look only at the, this initialization or seeding of epidemic. Or another approach is they don't use model, they just use like this standard observational uh, techniques. Like uh, here, look for example, how stringency indexes related to the uh, epidemic role, or like things like this. But we don't really use a modeling to estimate uh, how much, how fast infection spreads during what, uh, the ongoing epidemic, right? Is this distinction important? At the beginning, we thought it's not, but let's uh, look deeper. So this is a kind of a standard uh, situation. You have, this, you have this country, let's say Denmark, 
and this person uh, it's just have no no infection at all but this person arrives to uh, Denmark from let's say Germany and uh, this person brings uh, infection with him so uh, when epidemics you have an epidemic started so this person basically caused the epidemic if we imagine this epidemic uh, this person was uh, prevented uh, entering the country, so like border was closed. Well, maybe next person would come at, at some point to a country and would start the epidemic. So you can delay the epidemic for say one week. And if you prevent that person, then another person would come eventually. But then you can say, well, if we delay the epidemic long enough, we can prepare better, or we can, you know, vaccination will appear maybe well, if we, if we prevent the epidemic from starting for very, very long. So uh, maybe it would be a worth to, to do it. OK, so this is kind of natural. This is quite an easy to understand assumption, right? You don't really question this quite much, this type of uh, setup. But imagine a different situation. Now you have an epidemic which is already going on here. So there's a lot of people infecting each other. And now you're infecting infectious person arrive into Denmark from Germany again, bringing germs with. I can with. just like move the. Yeah, yeah. again. This? Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe you, you can ah. select just to show the. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, that's what we're Sorry, what, is the, what are those arrows describing? Or it's just like or... the people. Uh, so there's just epidemic so already. Like not going on and we're just like just moving just yeah. moving not just moving around infecting around right infecting around. yeah epidemic is already during its peak when the, like this infection person arrived right and when this person arrives and infects somebody and this somebody infects somebody else so he kind of starts a sub epidemic which mm. going on like this but the question now what would happen if you prevent this person from coming and like you have no idea, right? Maybe this, this sub epidemic would not happen at all, and this person, these this people would end up being not infected by the end of epidemic. Or maybe, uh, maybe somebody else would, would infect them instead. Like, imagine there was somebody here, they have guests from Germany, but there was another like pre infectious people already at this party. So it just happened with this infectious, uh, this German infected everybody first. But if he wasn't where, then somebody else would infect the same people. So, or, or maybe not, maybe the situation was the same. And you have this question, uh, what would happen if you have a restriction and you have this kind of complicated contrafactual situation, uh, no, Regardless of uh, like, how do you prove that uh, this person infected uh, this person? Like in this particular case, we use this very simple mathematical modeling. But even assuming you have a like hundred percent sure genetical proof, what uh, this like population was infected from this source, even in this case, you have no idea how you quantify absence of this person because the counterfactual situation is so. Like it's completely more complicated, uh, and we kind of uh, we would have these meetings about these papers, and we were talking like once a, a week or two times per month on these papers. So we just gathering together and uh, talk, discussing how we would quantify the effect of uh, mobility. And we were talking again, and next week we we would uh, meet again, and we discuss the same points again. We're talking again and again, like moving in circles that nothing was happening. But then at some point we realized what this situation is very different from this situation. Like this kind of jump is uh, somehow, even though situation seems to be similar, there is uh, a huge jump in uh, conceptual complexity of how you handle this problem. So after we, realized it, it was much more easier to approach this paper. So uh, what we decided, how, how do we handle this complicated situation at the end? 
Uh, first, we split basically all effects of mobility, and again, mobility into primary and secondary effects. And primary effect meaning just like, well, people move to it, how much, like the number of new infection uh, differ, differs because you have an open borders. And secondary effect is tries to estimate more of these counterfactuals, like what would happen eventually in the long term and so on. So let's uh, look at the primary effect first. So we have the following kind of uh, uh, formula for the primary effect. First, let's assume we have this new number of infection in country X. We can divide it into new infection, uh, like in, uh, infection among local residents. So something not really related to mobility, like local spread, plus the flow from Nordics, uh, plus the flow of infection from non-Nordic countries. These two things we can uh, split into positive flow and negative flow. So infectious people leaving to our Nordic countries and infection people arriving from other Nordic countries. So these are terms have to be positive, uh, but these terms could be either positive or negative. You have, can have negative flow uh, and you can have positive flow of infection. Now, if we look at these uh, terms more in more details, you have this um, counterfactual number of infection. How many people will get infected if like, you have no mobility at all? Plus, you have effect on commuting. So people like moving for half a day between countries. And this effect from commuting can be split in actually three different components. First component is reduction in this local infection due to, an, uh, due to people leaving. So both susceptible people are leaving and infectious people leaving. So there is less kind of chance of infection to spread here. Plus uh, where infectious people come in as uh, commuters to work in your country and they kind of spread infection where. And plus where people from your country uh, commuting to a different countries getting infected in, the, in these different countries and returning back. And these uh, three different components would be total net effect of mobility. So already, if you look at the pre primary effect, it's, you see it's not very simple. I mean, well, the model, I would say, is simple, but this, if you split it into these components, it's kind of uh, complicated now. And this is kind of how it's expressed mathematically. I wouldn't really maybe uh, stop here, but let's look at the results now. So we uh, plug it uh, like we fitted the model using MCMC to uh, actually data which we got, and then we started estimating these different quantities here. The first quantity I will show you is all kind of new infection and uh, uh, net mobility effect. And you look at the uh, pictures and you see that mobility is, uh, is kind of invisible here; it's always fluctuates around zero. You actually have to zoom it to, to see. And um, uh, indeed, it's you can see that it's pretty small compared to the number of local infections happening uh, or the total number of infections happening. Sometimes, at some points, it's basically summer 2020. When the number of local infections is low, it's kind of approaching here, but otherwise, it's much smaller. And as you can see, sometimes it can be negative. This net effect. Because like if you have open borders, more infectious people are leaving from you than they are arriving, particularly if you are Sweden here. And if you count actually the portion of uh, like this was net, net effect divided by a uh, number of new infection, you see sometimes it's actually reaching pretty high values like in Finland here because they have so few new infection uh, uh, when Net effect is kind of visible. So, conclusion: the impact of mobility is lower than the impact of local spreads, and the mobility or only affect the epidemic is the number of 
local infection is low. So we kind of have to have this, this balance, which I referred to at the beginning. So now remember these colors, you have this uh, effect from, or this uh, uh, three components effect from long distance travel uh, between Nordic countries and the fact from long distance travel uh, from non-Nordic countries and effect from community. And actually, I forgot to mention, we, all, we don't really uh, take into account commuting from non-Nordic countries because it kind of was low. And when we plot these uh, three different components here, and what we see is basically an effect from uh, non-Nordic and Nordic countries is kind of similar, maybe a little bit in size, um, but effect from net, from commuters is very low here. And this is a fact of commuters is, uh, here in orange, and it's also very, very close to zero. So um, uh, why it's happening is basically, it may be a model artifact here, basically com each commuter having a border crossing brings like one and half infectious, infectious day per border crossing because it stays only uh, for like half a day, while when a long-term travel is crossing the borders, we assume it's like days for a whole duration of infectious period. So it's supposed to be uh, eight days. We assume that uh, like with COVID, you have uh, eight infectious days. So it's kind of based on model assumptions here, but what's important here is uh, type of mobility does matter, right? If we would do it again, this type of study when like it's kind of important what people do when we cross the borders for how long they stay is something to be and we weren't able to actually quantify it from this data but looking forward it's kind of important to do it uh another uh this is picture showing uh, mobility uh, or effect caused by four different nordic countries within each shower so you see what it's like huge effect of sweden in the beginning uh, because we didn't have a lot of infections compared to the rest of Nordic countries. And because the rest of all Nordic countries have very little infection, uh, Sweden was spreading uh, infection to Norway, Denmark, and Finland. And it will begin like Denmark have a little bit of revenge here, and uh, Denmark actually supplying uh, cases to Sweden. Uh, and the conclusion here, right, there should be, uh, in addition to this disbalance, there should be actually traffic between countries. This is another way to look at, at, the, at the same figure, uh, the same numbers, but now we plot the kind of effective reproduction number and effective uh, multiplication number. So the effective reproduction number is the very kind of common quantity. Uh, which people love to talk about. So this is defined in terms of how much secondary cases on average one infection person causes. And this definition is not really suitable for us. So we made a, a new definition, we, we, uh, a new term, we call it effective multiplication numbers, uh, which kind of takes into account uh, the mobility. So this is defined as, as like for each uh, infected individuals, how many new infectious people appear for or for like for any reason. Effective reproduction number kind of assumes you infect them, but effective multiplication numbers assumes they could come from abroad as well. So we, uh, and if the number is below zero, epidemic uh, epidemic is declining, and this is above zero it's actually growing. And you can see very interesting situation appears somehow. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, uh, one, thank you very much. And you can see very interesting situation here when sometimes you have, um, for example, in summer in Norway here in summer in Finland, you have an effective reproduction number actually below one by effective multiplication number is above one, meaning that, uh, um, if you will have no mobility at all, epidemic will decline, but because we have a supply 
of the mobility uh, of people from infectious people from all the countries, epidemic is growing regardless. So this is another way to float it. And this is kind of another picture with the same numbers, but this is like probability that your reproduction number uh, is bigger than one. And you can see, for example, here then like the probability of about 80% uh, epidemic is growing only because you have a supply for, uh, from people from abroad. And if you cross the border, the epidemic would decline and somehow here. So, and this is yet another way to look at the uh, kind of same, maybe same numbers, but this is just um, uh, proportion of pre infectious prevalence. So, proportion of infectious people. In the now here is a gray line, the proportion of infectious people in your population, and the, here is a CN line. Here is proportion among people coming from non the countries, and uh, this is like proportion of commuters. And uh, for commuters, you notice because they only commute during weekdays, they kind of a little bit like. Ch -ch -ch -ch. So, and this is log scale. So, sometimes it's basically like here in Finland in summer, uh, among, among people coming to Finland, um, there's hundreds, uh, like prevalence is like 100 times more, the COVID is 100 times more prevalent than the local population. And uh, if you look at this picture, and it's like completely messages, right? I show you one picture and I say, well, the mobility kind of doesn't matter. And I show you another picture and say, well, mobility actually uh, matters a lot. And like where it was uh, 100 times more uh, infections coming from Sweden than where it was in Finland. So what do we do with it? And like, yeah, I don't know. This is conflicting messages. The situation is uh, kind of complicated, but my conclusion it is like it does matter uh, mobility does matter but it only matter in a certain condition and it doesn't matter in if those conditions are not met uh, so maybe it's it's kind of makes sense to close the borders but it maybe does make sense to like close the borders for a long time now let's talk briefly about secondary effects we have 10 minutes for exactly, I just need to, exactly 10 minutes to talk about secondary effects. Mm -hmm. So what we talk about secondary effects, uh, we talk about counterfactuals. Uh, so basically we have our model and then we uh, like do an intervention on the model and look how things would uh, develop. So here we have a, a posterior sample for the numbers of uh, total number of infectious individuals, I think, in both countries. So this is our kind of estimate. We say, oh, hey, at this particular, at the beginning of July, we implement an intervention and close the borders. Uh, let's look how uh, these epidemic trajectories would change. And uh, what we do here is compare the average with kind of pictures quite complicated. So we look at the average and um, so here is kind of an estimated average for number of infected individuals. And this is like quantifactual trajectory if mobility was set to zero from the first April and is continuing up to here. And this is counterfactual if it uh, was set up to zero from the first of May, from the first June, and so on and so forth and so forth. So we continue with counterfactuals uh, only for like 100 days otherwise. Like is counterfactual assuming nothing else would change, which is very weird assumption to do. So, so we like believe it's only reasonable uh, for limited amount of days. Otherwise, of course, if uh, if the number of infection would be very different, then uh, when people would change their behavior, something else would change. But all right, so what you can see from these counterfactuals, maybe the, uh, the same conclusion which I already told you. So yeah, sometimes if you implement this, uh, um, this restriction, like nothing would change, you even 
don't see any change here, but sometimes you're right. Indeed, if the number of infections very low, when it like goes down even closer to zero, this is the uh, number of infections per population. And uh, yeah, so kind of same-ish conclusions, but in a different. What we can do with counterfactuals, well, uh, and what we can do with uh, this primary estimation is like play with different scenarios and uh, like more complicated one. For example, this is a scenario where instead of uh, closing the, board, the borders, we actually encourage travel and assume that travel would return to pre-pandemic pre uh, conditions. And you can see that like in this space, the number of infection would go up naturally, but they actually wouldn't go very high. They would reach like from one infection per 1,000 to 10 infection per thousand, for example, in Norway. So there would be effect, but it wouldn't be uh, visible. And in Sweden, you can notice a little bit that uh, number of infection in Sweden would even go down because Sweden would spread very infectious individuals and leave less uh, inside here. And for Sweden, that would be yes. Let, let everyone go somewhere. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, this is because we Sweden have like this specific situation at the beginning and of course and at the rest of the day it would not be so but this was actually my last slide uh, so well my conclusion I uh, started to you at the beginning maybe one kind of technical conclusion or philosophical conclusion if you even if you handle a problem which very similar to a common problem or a textbook problem sometimes a huge uh, jump in conceptual uh, complexity. So we have like had hard time understanding what there is much hard to uh, define the effect of uh, mobility when it happened in going epidemic and this kind of delayed the conclusion of this paper for one year I think. Uh, so yeah, it's sometimes nice to just go to the beginning and think a little bit. But this is all. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Great. Questions? Really interesting stuff. And I'm kind of thinking that, that if you think of the situation where the governments were like in 2020, they were making all these decisions with where the level of knowledge was that, yeah, I mean, some people somewhere said that probably travel matters or doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there was no scenario tool whatsoever available. Mm -hmm. so, so simply having something like this when the next one comes, and I hope it's not next four, but yeah. next three, like uh, more years, uh, it, it, it's something really useful. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not the first paper, obviously, on these matters, but um, kind of um, the existing knowledge was, was focusing on how you can delay the infection. Yeah. Uh, then, then, like, you don't have any infections going on. And then we have, like, this uh, discussion, like, should we close the border, should we not close the border to European countries? And, well, like, when Australia or, or Asian countries tried to mm -hmm. have a complete border closure, it was criticized by saying, well, you, you cannot do anything like this in countries. But since you're now, like, if you are uh, Australian, when you actually can manage to, to do it with. Yeah. So this was kind of counter yeah. um, standard narrative, actually, but... Yeah. And most probably, I mean, next time this happens, the situation is going to be pretty much the same that, that when governments start thinking about these things, it's too late already. So it's in every country already. Mm. So the scenario is exactly, mm. uh, it's, it's not delaying the epidemic, yeah. but being in a situation where it is already in yes. all countries yeah. and what should we do now? And this is the first first analysis of that scenario I've ever seen. And as such, I think this is this is pretty, mm -hmm. like, pretty useful. Yeah, I also think like our conclusion, uh, I don't may be very counterintuitive or super like, Surprising, they right? just like, yeah, common understanding is kind of correct, right? But, but of course, I mean, another thing is when people close the borders, there's some kind of psychological effect or like sending a message effect to a population, like, hey, this is really critical situation. Uh, even if you like 
don't really want you to go to Sweden and maybe like cross the border to kind of send the message for you to like stay at home, mm. right? And this is also something that's not naturally implemented here, but this is like practical effect, uh, practically implemented with uh, border closures is of course much more complicated, but uh, indeed this is, this is very practical kind of. And I'm thinking of the same as also, I mean, the model is exactly the same if you would apply this to the closing mark mm -hmm. for example, yeah. about whether you should close, close up regions or not. And yeah. again, then it was based on the, all the decisions were based on the custody instead of any quantitative analysis like this. So this is. This is, this is yeah, I mean, Osima was closed by a kind of it was political decision. Yeah, 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 yeah. recommended by. Uh, and and they, I don't think that no one at, 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 at that time, I don't think that there was no one in this country who could have quantified. I mean, th th there were no, no one would be able to that quickly compute that. Well, oh, no, if we close it, this is going to be how. I, know, so I, I was in, in the country and we were running the model that I think we are actually uh, like. I don't think like the government actually asked us. Uh, I was in the official like, kind of COVID modeling team. Government wasn't asking us to like quantify yeah. something, just close the border and say, please quantify what it was kind of correct solution mm -hmm. instead. So if you, I don't know if you've been where like it, in Finland you begin in 2020, but like in the beginning of, I think it was April uh, till uh, uh, where this capital region was closed. So we were able to travel to our uh, region of Finland from Usima. And it was like for about a month. Yeah. Yeah, now, now I think this year, uh, all the healthcare regions are now preparing new contingency plans, which probably include the plans for the next pandemic. And at least I might work with some NGO people who work then with their Covid contact tracing data, and they they are really serious now about this. Mm -hmm. that, that next time we'll do better, and, and and they want to have all sorts of predictive modeling capabilities that are ready from the get go. But this happens next time, and all that. So having anything like this for the next, I mean, this is exactly what very many people want at this stage. So. Yeah, yeah, it's but it's, but it's also a kind of funding to share the knowledge of the organization. So. Uh, let's see what, if I manage to, to do something. This is uh, now, now this is a part of my talk when I complain a lot about government but like, uh, like so obviously this was not the first epidemic ever. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. We have a um, fine through before, which was in 2010, which was also kind of huge deal. It's turned out to be not a huge deal, but it was a huge deal, as, uh, perceived as a huge deal. And uh, there was a lot of kind of clever system uh, implemented by government, say these these registries, which online registries, which haven't existed before, trying to find it, like which was like reporting in real time a number of hospitalization and and uh, and registered uh, cases uh, to the modeler, so we kind of understand where things is going. But like ten years uh, passed between swine flu and COVID, and this system was kind of completely forgotten. And it, uh, when COVID started, this online kind of registry didn't exist again. They have to be recreated. Mm -hmm. It was maybe easier to do it second time, but yeah. uh, I think if they have all these consistency plans where all this kind of fear, they made it, they put it in the um, uh, in some kind of folder, in some table, and then uh, like 10 years passed and nobody knows where this folder is lying anymore. Uh, I think there's some kind of, you know, ideas and we were in Abbas in this conference where I think we should have like a kind of simulation games or something like this to, to retain this uh, kind of... Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, think, I think most probably, I mean, just about now, which is that everyone still remembers that we were going to most of the time, in five years, if the next one hasn't happened, then no one, no one remembers that there was something that so, so for any funding, for, for doing anything, now is kind of the time to prepare for the next one because after five years, no one will give you a euro for that. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, I already believe it's, it's, it's already enough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Like it, it, might, it might, but, but still, and, and I kind of wish that it's not too late. We don't have a big <laughs> influence of pandemic next fall, but okay. no, it, it's,
Okay, any any more questions? Maybe question from people online. Did you did you have data for iPhone? We did not. Okay, unfortunately. It would be an interesting. Yeah, I, I talk about this Nordic countries and uh, like mm -hmm. um Iceland is not included here. I hope nobody is offended. No. Yeah. And they yeah, they have like what is it? one air force, so it's very nice. It's super small. Yeah, I think not not yeah, maybe it's even like a benchmark or a spacebar or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How different is it really is? Yeah. I don't know. Does anyone know how how uh Hard did COVID hit Iceland? I don't know. I guess comparatively to our Nordic country as well. So, not okay. very much. And there is a huge lot of tourists there. So, you know, mm -hmm. there are times that there are more people from abroad than Iceland. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, even if you think about Finland, the first case was detected in Lapland, not in the capital region. Mainly in yeah, Japan. I mean, it's true. Detected. I mean, and that's by the way, some of the small modeling came out. I'm not sure if anyone has really taken into account in, in these moments because, of it, because it, there are many introductions where it doesn't fly off. So the virus mm -hmm. comes with someone, maybe they infect someone else and that's that. So, so very many introductions in the real world do not work at all like in mean field models. So you introduce someone but nothing happens and, mm -hmm. and you can actually introduce very many people and nothing happens yeah. until something. And so, to, and, and that the effect of this is probably pretty difficult, and that's that's only for the very beginning of the epidemic, and that's that's probably not so easy to quantify because mean field doesn't really work here. You need to have some. If you if you look at like I don't know, I've run simulations on the of the days, yeah. days uh, the university data, and it works mm. nothing like me. And the like, like if for it, which we know now that is super spreading, it's highly important. Uh, so we kind of. This kind of threshold where mean field uh, uh, starts is kind of much higher yeah, than yeah. for flu, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as you see, these effects are, are actually kind of important only when mean field assumption kind of you know, really uh, hold. So this is kind of um, uh, um, kind of problem in in our. Solution. Like one thing we did is that we have this time varying reproduction number, so it's kind of fluctuating. And we argued this is kind of a substitute of, or some mm -hmm. kind of proxy for, for super spreading. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We actually had this discussion about uh, the whole concept that even if you forget about mean these other models, which are more delicate, still they are average over so many different scenarios. Mm -hmm. I mean, the perception of the epidemic is very tricky because at the very end, what happens is like one of the few cases, and the system is not similar to those self-arranged systems. Exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. So I mean, if you have enough cases, yeah. but at the beginning, it's like anything. I think it's almost entirely unpredictable. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So what will happen? Yeah, yeah. And also, this is, I mean, if you have a system of percolation, mm -hmm. you know that uh, you yeah. get avalanches of any size. Yeah, which which is then what may happen in such cases where you're not really yet flying off, but then yeah. all bets are off. So, so mm -hmm. yeah, kind of the, the sort of yeah. fundamental unpredictability of of epidemic spreading is something that which yeah. maybe get a bit yeah. of a better grip. Yeah, I mean, we also had this discussion very soon about that. Even the earliest stages are not really that exponential. Yeah. So that's the big thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, people online. I guess.